Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tatay mo yung mic na isa. Opa, ano naman na sa'yo, Dal? Okay na. Ayan, naka-echo pa. Okay yan. Ayan, okay na. So, good evening, everyone. Tonight's lecture will be Benign and Malignant Tumors, uh, which, will, which will encompass two very long chapters from Camp Bell. So, if you will bear with me, it's going to be uh, a lecture that will consist of 130, 120 slides, but I tried to make it as compact as possible. Okay, so first, the objectives. So first, uh, describe the various benign renal tumors. Next, the malignant renal tumors. And with each description, also describe the treatment for those tumors. So first, we begin with the benign renal tumors. Benign renal tumors are ever increasing because of routine imaging. Even among suspected RCC cases, 20% of resected cases are benign. The management of lesions is based on the perceived risk of malignancy. The common symptoms uh, include flank pain, a palpable mass, and hematuria. However, most diagnoses result from an incidental renal mass on imaging. Clues uh, to a benign entity will include thin enhanced walls, which will point towards a simple cyst, macroscopic fat, which will lead you to a suspicion of AML, and smaller size, lack of growth on serial imaging, female sex, and older age. However, none except lack of growth over time can reliably rule out malignancy. So the first for our benign renal tumors is the renal cyst. It is the most common benign entity in the kidney. Up to 10% of the population may harbor a renal cyst with putative risk factors of increasing age, male gender, hypertension, and worsening renal function. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD, is an inherited renal cystic disease related to alterations in cilia function through mutations of PKD1 and PKD2. Um, on a side note, the, mechanisms, the mechanism by which cysts develop was initially described as a progression from a diverticulum on the tubular epithelium that ultimately detaches from the tubule to, perform, to form a true cyst in the kidney interstitium. So the diagnosis of ADPKD um, is characterized by the presence of two unilateral or bilateral renal cysts before the age of 30, or at least two cysts in each kidney between the ages of 30 and 59, and four cysts in each kidney in patients 60 and above. Um, ACKD, or acquired cystic kidney disease, is a special circumstance in which Renal cyst development is preceded by the development of chronic and end-stage renal disease. The cysts of ACKD arise from the proximal convoluted tubule, as is similar with clear cell RCC, unlike the cysts of ADPKD and sporadic renal cysts, which arise from the distal tubule. The development of cysts is largely dependent on the length of time on dialysis, with up to 80% of patients developing cysts after 10 years. Unlike genetic and sporadic renal cyst disease, ACKD is associated with the development of RCC. Almost 7% develop RCC after 10 years of dialysis. Kidneys of patients with ADPKD increase in size exponentially over time, uh, with a mean increase of 5% total volume per year. Um, ACKD patients also show that renal volumes can increase to three times their native size by 20 years of dialysis, which are attributed to the renal cysts. Sporadic renal cysts increase in size and number over time with an average growth, of, growth rate of 1.6 millimeters per year. For the evaluation of renal cysts, most, again, most are diagnosed incidentally. Uh, if there are presenting symptoms, they usually consist of pain from local expansion, a palpable mass, hematuria, or pulmonary symptoms from the mass effect in ADPKD. For imaging, uh, we can use ultrasound, CT, and MRI. The goal of imaging in cystic renal disease is the evaluation of malignancy risk as defined by increasing malignancy. To aid in the evaluation of renal cyst disease, the Bosnia classification is commonly used to characterize cysts, cysts and their risk for malignancy. So this is the Bosniak classification for renal cysts. Uh, I won't read the whole thing. I'll just um, dictate the, the essential uh, 
uh, characteristics for each grade. For Bosniak 1, uh, it is a simple sit, sis that does not contain septa, calcification, or solid components. It has a 1.7% risk for malignancy. And in these cases, there is no required therapy or follow-up. For Bosniak 2, there are a few hairline thin septa and fine calcifications or a short segment of slightly thickened calcification we present in the wall or septa. High attenuation lesions less than 3 cm are also included in this group. Uh, their risk for malignancy is 18.5%, but there is also no requirement for therapy or follow-up. For Bosniak 2F, these cysts may contain multiple hairline thin septa or minimal smooth thickening of the wall or septa. The calcifications may be thick and nodular. Also, totally intrarenal non-enhancing high attenuation renal lesions more than 3 cm are also included here. The difference here between the 2 and 2F is for Bosniak 2F, you have to do repeat imaging to assess the stability of size and radiographic uh, characteristics. For Bosniak 3, uh, these are your indeterminate cystic masses that have thickened irregular or smooth walls or septa in which there is contrast, contrast enhancement. They have a risk for malignancy of 33%, and they require active surveillance, excision, or ablation. For Bosniak 4, these are clearly malignant cystic masses, and these also include enhancing soft tissue components. So they have a 92.5% risk for malignancy, and they require excision or ablation. So these are CT uh, scan images of uh, Bosniak 2 renal cysts. Over here are Bosniak 3 cysts, uh, which have thick irregular septae and inhomogeneous character. And here are your Bosniak 4 cysts uh, with enhancing nodular areas and in inhomogeneity. So for the management of renal cysts, uh, it is based on the risk for malignancy and the associated symptoms. Simple renal cysts uh, cysts require no additional follow-up and serial imaging for Bosniak 2F lesions. Patients with ACKD and ADPKD should have serial imaging. Um, surgical resection or ablation is recommended for Bosniak 3 and 4 lesions and occasional renal cysts may require treatment because of local symptoms such as uh, which the treatments which include aspiration, cyst liquidation, cystic sclerotherapy, and arterial embolization. The next benign renal tumor is the oncocytoma. It is the second most common benign tumor and it's the most common benign enhancing mass. Uh, it is 25% of renal masses smaller than 3 cm. Grossly, they have a mahogany brown surface similar to that of normal parenchyma with a variably present central scar. They can be associated with perirenal fat invasion and renal vein invasion. Um, in cases in which the diagnostic dilemma is between chromophobe RCC and oncocytoma, cytokeratin 7 is useful. It is rarely positive in oncocytomas and diffusely positive in chromophobe RCC. Uh, genetic predisposition e exists in patients with berthog jube syndrome or BHD and renal oncocytomas. For the evaluation of oncocytoma, uh, most cases occur asymptomatically as unilateral incidental masses, although 5% occur bilaterally. The definitive, the definitive diagnosis for these tumors is post-operatively after resection. Um, for clues on imaging, uh, they are hypervascular and again with a central scar on axial imaging. When suspicion of oncocytoma is high based on imaging, renal mass biopsy has been used with some success. Uh, however, recent meta-analysis reported relatively low positive predictive value of 67% of or oncocytoma on renal mass biopsy. So given that the mainstay of management is post-operative observation, uh, in the setting of diagnosis based on biopsy, the role of active surveillance has had favorable, favorable results. When oncocytoma is suspected but uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty exists or treatment is indicated, nephron sparing approaches should be the standard. Uh, next is our angiomyolipoma or AML. Uh, it is a benign renal entity composed of dysmorphic blood vessels, smooth muscle, and adipose tissue. It can occur sporadically or as part of genetic syndromes such as uh, tuberous sclerosis complex, 
um, in which there's a prevalence of 55 to 90 percent of AML and um, lymphangial leiomyomatosis. Uh, there's a prevalence of 0.13% with a female predisposition and peak in the 4th and 5th decade. Now, for AML, uh, like I said, TSC is the most well-described inheritable cause of AML. It arises from a mutation in either the TSC1 or the TSC2, and the inheritance is autosomal dominant, although there are also sporadic mutations which are common. The AMLs are thought to arise from perivascular epithel uh, epithelioid cells and often grouped together with other perivascular epithelioid cell tumors. Grossly, they are well circumscribed with a tan, pink, or yellow surface. Uh, also, the vessels are thick-walled with eccentric and eccentric with spindle cells around vessels, and adipocytes are mature without atypia. However, there are cir special circumstances, such as in the case of epithelioid AML, which is characterized by minimal fat content and an abundance of epithelioid cells. Um, atypia within the epithelioid cells, the presence of mitotic figures, and necrosis are common and suggest a more aggressive course. Metastatic disease has been reported in a third of the cases. Also, there are AML mimics, such as your sarcomas and RCC. In these cases, melanocyte markers such as HMB45 and melan A are important states to aid in diagnosis. Now, AMLs uh, are mostly incidental. 15% have Wunderlich syndrome, which is a spontaneous retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And contrary to other benign renal masses, the diagnosis of AML can be made on the imaging. The presence of macroscopic fat on CT or MRI is AML. This will be 15 to 20 Hansfeld units on non-enhanced CT. Uh, ultrasonographically, the masses are hyperechoic, similar to RMC, RCCs. The treatment is indiv individualized based on the following. Uh, sporadic versus syndromic AML, symptoms, and the risk of hemorrhage. Historically, 4CM was the cutoff size for surgical intervention. However, more recent studies have shown that this size should not be used as an absolute indi indication as there are cases with larger tumors that have been successfully managed conservatively. A retroperitoneal hemorrhage is the overarching concern in AML. An intralesional aneurysm larger than 5 millimeters was predictive of hemorrhage. So when considering observation for patients, it's prudent to assess first for intralesional aneurysms for risk stratification. Also, when considering observation, pregnancy must be considered as there is a reported association of hemorrhage with pregnancy. So, this is an algorithm regarding the um, diagnostics and treatment for AML. So, when a section is chosen, nephron sparing approaches should be performed. And in terms of the treatment, uh, as for ev ev everolimus, everolimus is, a, is an mTOR inhibitor and studies have shown a response rate of 42% uh, of cases having more than 50% size reduction. Next benign renal tumor is the papillary adenoma of the kidney. It is a low-grade, well-circumscribed cortical lesion measuring less than 0.5 centimeters with an association with papillary RCC in 47% of cases and are often when associated with RCC. It is often diagnosed pathologically as a concomitant finding with RCC and therefore require no further directed therapy. Next is metanephric adenoma. It is a rare benign epithelial lesion in the kidney which can present at any age, although it peaks in the fifth decade and more often in females. Approximately half of cases are diagnosed incidentally. However, the remainder experience symptoms of flank pain, gross hematuria, palpable mass, and polycythemia. They appear, they appear as well-circumscribed tan brown masses up to 15 centimeters in size. They stain positively for Wilms tumor protein WT1 and CD57, which is the opposite for RCC. On CT, they appear hypovascular with minimal enhancement and calcifications. Uh, like the other tumors, diagnosis is made after resection. Next is the mixed mesenchymal and uh, are the mixed mesenchymal and epithelial tumors such as uh, your cystic nephroma. This is a rare benign tumor that occur that occurs in the youth and adults. It is often solitary central cystic masses with calcifications extending into the collecting system with septal enhancement. 
However, it is difficult to distinguish it from the Wilms tumor and is often diagnosed after resection. The key finding that differentiates it from Wilms tumor is the lack of lastimal and embryonal elements. Um, now, your mixed epithelial and stromal tumors are benign tumors of the kidney that are often identified in perimenopausal women, often with a history of estrogen replacement with a peak incidence in the fifth decade. On imaging, they appear as complex cystic masses, usually Bosniak 3 to 4, similar to RCC, and diagnosis is made after resection. They have a mean size of 6 cm and are encapsulated with solid and cystic components that often extend into the renal pelvis. Next is the lyomyoma, which is a rare renal tumor of smooth muscle differentiation. They can arise anywhere in the urinary tract, uh, and the bladder is actually the most common site. The renal capsule is most often is the most how most often described location. However, uh, small exophytic masses that are hyperdense on non-contrast CT with hypo enhancement with IV contrast, uh, and management depends on, on the certainty of diagnosis before intervention and nephron sparing approaches are preferred. For your hemangiomas, uh, these are rare tumors that arise from a developmental abnormality in which perirenal lymphatics do not communicate with the rest of the lymphatic system, resulting in dilated cystic masses around the renal capsule, sinus, or peripelvic fat. They are often incidental, and the symptoms include obstructive uropathy, hypertension, hematuria, proteinuria, hemorrhage, and gyluria. Next is your JG cell tumor, which is also known as a renoma, uh, which is most, present, most common in women in their 20s and 30s. The hallmark of these tumors is the overproduction of renin, which will produce symptoms of hyperaldosteronism, such as polydipsia, polyuria, myalgias, double vision, and headache. On CT, it is a small renal mass that is solid and non-enhancing. For young hypertensive patients, this must be taken into consideration. Once diagnosed, surgical resection results in resolutions of, resolution of symptoms in most patients. However, up to 10% have persistent hypertension because of hypertensive angiopathy. And lastly, we have our renomedullary interstitial cell tumor and the uh, intrarenal schwannomas. For your renomedullary interstitial cell tumors, they arise within the renal medulla, and they're often small, multifocal, and composed of spindle and stellate cells. For your intrarenal schwannomas, they arise from the nerve sheet tissue in the renal parenchyma and they present with malaise, fever, weight loss, and abdominal pain. So those are, are our benign renal tumors. So now I will move on to our malignant renal tumors. Okay. So for imaging and clinical risk stratification, the strongest predictors of malignancy are male sex and increasing tumor size. Men have threefold increase of risk of malignancy, and the likelihood of malignancy increases per centimeter of tumor diameter. Um, for example, 20 to 30 percent of renal masses less than four centimeters are benign, and 40 percent of renal masses less than two centimeters are benign. Uh, also, majority of renal masses discovered are via incidental imaging. So, for the radiographic evaluation of renal masses. Um, it is a strong predictor of malignancy and metastatic potential. Multi-phase cross-sectional imaging is recommended. It provides the most accurate, accurate characterization of renal masses while assessing for locally advanced features and intra-abdominal metastasis and readily excludes AML by ident identifying intralesional fat. IVP and renal arteriography are no longer recommended. So... For CT scan, it remains the most important radiographic testing for delineating the nature of the renal mass. Enhancement of greater than 15 to 20 Hounsfield units is indicative of RCC, although this does not preclude benign histology. Solid masses have substantial areas of negative CT attenuation, um, indicative of fat that are diagnostic for AML. So picture A shows a solid right posterior renal mass. And picture B shows the same mass after IV contrast administration, and it shows that the mass enhances more than 20 Hounsfield units. Um, MRI is an alternative, alternative standard imaging modality, and um, in this imaging modality, enhancement of more than 20% with IV gadolinum is based contrast is suggestive of RCC. 
It is helpful for masses less than 2 cm. It is also useful for differentiating tissue planes and defining extent of vascular involvement. However, there is a risk for nephrogenic systemic fibrosis when using gadolinium-based contrast. Um, so in these pictures, in picture A, uh, which is pre-contrast, we have a lower pole tumor in the left kidney. Uh, image B, we have a visible thrombus uh, in the left kidney, as uh, shown by the arrow, and C is the cortical phase. Now, additional points. Um, solid tumor architecture is also predictive of malignancy. Tumor location, complexity, relationship of mass with the renal hilum, collecting system, polarity, and endophytic and exophytic location are also considered. Um, composite uh, complexity profiles such as the renal score, which composes of your radius, um, or if it's endophytic or exophytic, nearness to the collecting system, anter anterior or posterior, and location relative to your polar lines. Also, infiltrative growth patterns broaden the differenti differential diagnosis. Urothelial cancer, lymphoma, infectious processes, high-grade or sarcomatoid RCC. So this is an algorithm for the diagnostic of diagnostics for renal masses. So it's too long to read, so I'll just let you read, them, read it by yourself. So our first uh, malignant renal tumor is renal cell carcinoma or RCC. It accounts for 2 to 3% of all adult malignant neoplasms and is the most lethal of the common neurologic cancers. It is primarily a disease of older adults, typically presenting between 55 to 75 years of age. The majority of cases are sporadic and only 4 to 6% are believed to be familial. It is relatively uncommon in the pediatric population and in those cases, an aggressive surgical approach with formal lymphadenectomy has been recommended at the time of radical nephrectomy when RCC is suspected. Um, it is traditionally thought to arise primarily from the proximal convoluted tubules, which is true for clear cell and papillary variants. Chromophobe RCC and collecting the carcinoma are derived from the more distal components of the nephron. The most generally accepted environmental risk is tobacco exposure which is found in 20 to 30% of men and 10 to 20% of women. Obesity and hypertension are, are also accepted risk factors for RCC. Now, uh, we'll move on to the familial and, familial and renal cell carcinoma and molecular genetics. So, the familiar form of clear cell RCC is von Hippel-Lindau disease or VHL, which is an autosomal dominant disorder that occurs in one out of 36,000 individuals. The most common abnormality is a mutation in the VHL tumor suppressor gene. Um, and its major manifestations include the development of RCC, pheochromocytoma, retinal angiomas, and hemangioblastomas. All these tumor types are highly vascular and can lead to substantial morbidity. RCC develops in 50% of patients with VHL disease and is distinctive for early age at onset which is often in the third to fifth decades of life, and bilaterality and multifocal involvement. RCC is the most common cause of mortality in patients with VHL. So this is the incidence of major tumor types of VHL by the subtype and type of mutation. Uh, now for hereditary papillary renal carcinoma syndrome, it is the second most common histologic subtype of RCC and is characterized by trisomy for chromosome 7 and 17. Hereditary papillary renal carcinoma or HPRC, uh, its median age is at 45 years and most developed multifocal and bilaterally papillary RCC, although more common is type 1 RCC. Most patients do not develop tumors in other organ systems and it has an autosomal dominant mode of transmission. Next are the hered hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma, or HLRCC. This is a familial renal cancer syndrome in which patients commonly develop cutaneous and leiomyomas and type 2 papillary RCC. It also has uh, an autosomal dominant inheritance and a mutation in the tumor suppressor gene fumarate, hyd uh, fumarate hydratase, or FH. The renal tumors are unusual for this uh, familial RCC, and when they occur, they are often solitary, unilateral, and aggressive. 
which is in 15 to 20%. In these cases, prompt surgical intervention is recommended. Next is succinate dihydrogenase renal cell carcinoma. It presents with bilateral multifocal uh, masses and early onset, less than 40 years old, along with pheochromocytomas and head and neck paragangliomas. This occurs with germline mutations in one of the multiple genes encoding the subunits of the Krebs cycle enzyme succinate dihydrogenase. Next is the um, Berthog Dub syndrome or BHD syndrome, which presents with cutaneous fibrofolliculomas, lung cysts, spontaneous pneumothoraces, and a variety of renal tumors derived from the distal nephron, such as your chromophobe RCC, oncocytomas, and hybrid oncocytic tumors. The BHD gene is at chromosome 17, and the gene product is folliculin. It holds us an autosomal dominant inheritance. Next is your Cowden syndrome, which is one of several syndromes that result, in, that result from germline mutation of the phosphatase and tensin homologer, P10 suppressor, tumor suppressor gene. Uh, it has a 34% lifetime risk of RCC, 50% risk of breast cancer, and 10% risk of epithelial thyroid carcinoma. Next is the aforementioned tuberous sclerosis complex, or TSC, which has an autosomal dominant disorder that manifests with characteristic tumors in multiple organ systems. Again, in AML, also cortical tubers, subependymal nodules, uh, pulmonary lymphangiomyomatosis, cardiac rhabdomyomas, and facial angiofibromas. In these cases, AMLs are multifocal, bilateral, and often large. Uh, RCCs, uh, clear cell in type occur in 2 to 3 percent. Uh, next, um, this is tumor biology and its clinical implications. So, this um, chart shows the resistance to cytotoxic therapy of malignant renal masses. Uh, RCC has demonstrated only limited responses to cytotoxic chemo chemotherapeutic agents. Um, so moving on to immunobiology and immune tolerance, overall response rates with cytokine and other immune-based approaches for RCC were disappointing, typically ranging from 15 to 20% despite a variety of creative treatment strategies. Uh, suboptimal results suggested immune tolerance likely induced by the tumor. So the factors down-regulating down the effector T cells are your cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4 or CTLA4 and programmed death one or PD-1, the increased activation of these receptors by the tumor leads to immune tolerance. Recent trials have demonstrated that humanized antibodies that block PD-1, such as or nivolumab or pembrolizumab or PDL one atezolizumab or CTLA-1, epilimumab, can lead to complete and durable responses for metastatic RCC. However, side effects have been noted such as autoimmune diseases, uh, which compose of enterocolitis, hepatitis, dermatitis, and pneumonitis. Um, as for angiogenesis, um, kinase inhibitors such as your bevacizumab target the VEGF pathway uh, is currently being tested. As for the cancer genome, there is a metabolic shift in aggressive renal cancers. Um, for the signal transduction and cell cycle regulation pathways, mTOR inhibitors such as your TEMC-Rolimus and Everolimus have shown efficacy in whom tyrosine kinase inhibitors have failed. Now, moving on to the pathology of malignant renal tumors, uh, most RCCs are round to ovoid, circumscribed by a pseudocapsule of compressed parenchyma and fibrous tissue. Most RCCs are not grossly infiltrative, except for collecting duct CA and sarcomatoid virants. Most pathologists agree that there are no reliable histologic or ultrastructural criteria to differentiate benign from malignant renal epithelial tumors, except oncocytoma and your small low-grade papillary adenomas. Now, for your grading, um, so it ranges from 1 to 4, uh, ranging from your 1, which consists of nuclei which are absent, and inconspicuous and, yeah, and to four where there is extreme nuclear pleomorphism, multinucleated giant cells, and or rhabdoid and sarcomatoid differentiation. For the behavior, um, aggressive 
local behavior can be seen in invasion of renal capsule, the renal sinus, or the collecting system, which occurs in 20% of cases. Um, there's also predilection of malignant renal tumors for involvement of the venous system, which occurs in 10% of cases, which is more often than any other type of tumor. Uh, contiguous tumor thrombi can extend into the renal vein and IVC and ascend as high as the right atrium. Most cases are, most sporadic cases are solitary and bilateral, bilaterality occurs in 2 to 4%, multicentricity in 10 to 20%. All RCCs are adenocarcinomas derived from the renal tubular epithelial cells and arise from the proximal tubular cells. Uh, chromophobe RCC, renal medullary RCC, and collecting duct CA appear to be derived from the more distant elements of the nephron as was discussed earlier. For the subtypes, current practice is to identify the primary histologic subtype and comment on the presence and existence of sarcomatoid differentiation. So for our subtypes, first is our clear cell renal uh, cell carcinoma, which accounts for 70 to 80% of all RCCs. Grossly, it is yellow and highly vascular. Microscopically, it is composed of clear cells, as is the name, granular or eosinophilic cells, or mixed types. They have a worse prognosis compared to papillary type 1 or chromophobe RCC. They more likely respond to VEGF-targeted therapy, checkpoint inhibitors, or high-dose IL-2 than other types of REC, which means it has a better prognosis when metastatic. Um, now, your next subtype is your papillary renal cell carcinoma. It is the second most common, which occurs in 10 to 15% of malignant renal tumors. And grossly, it looks beige-white in color, spherical boundary, frequent hemorrhage, and cystic components. Microscopically, uh, it has eosinophilic or basophilic cells arranged in a papillary configuration. It has a tendency towards multicentricity, which occurs in 40% of cases. Now, it has two distinct variants, as was mentioned before. Type 1 papillary RCC is more common. Uh, it, it has basophilic cells with scant neoplasm. Um, it is the more common type in hereditary papillary renal carcinoma, or HR, HPRC. Um, type 2 papillary RCC is the more aggressive variant with isonophilic and abundant cytoplasm. It is found more commonly in hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal carcinoma. So type 1 in HPRC, type 2 in HLRCC. Um, it is likely hypovascular and type 1 papillary RCC carries a better prognosis than clear cell RCC, whereas type 2 is similar or worse than clear cell RCC. Um, next, um, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma is a distinctive histologic subtype of RCC that represents 3 to 5% of all RCCs and appears to be derived from the distal convoluted tubules. It is commonly seen in BHD syndrome, uh, but most cases are sporadic. The tumor cells exhibit a relatively transparent cytoplasm with fine reticular pattern that's a plant cell appearance. And with a perinuclear clearing or halo with uh, microvesicles. Uh, they have a better prognosis for localized chromophobe RCC than for clear cell RCC, but poor outcome for those with sarcomatoid features or metastatic disease. So here are pictures of your chromophobe RCC, uh, a homogeneous tan tumor. And on picture B, you have your chromophobic cells with a plant cell appearance. And lastly is with staining of hail, uh, colloidal iron, which is diagnostic for your chromophobe RCC. Next is your collecting duct carcinoma. Um, <clears throat> and the, the carcinoma of the collecting ducts of Bellini is a rare subtype with a pure, poor prognosis. Most are large infiltrative masses with extension into the cortex. Microscopically, they appear admixed as an admixture of dilated tubules and papillary structures lined by a single layer of cuboidal cells, creating a cobblestone appearance. Most reported cases have been high-grade, in advanced stage, and unresponsive to conventional therapy. Next is your renal medullary carcinoma which is an uncommon subtype of RCC that occurs almost exclusively in patients with the sickle cell trait. So in young African-Americans in their 30s, most cases are locally advanced and metastatic at the time of diagnosis. 
uh, most cases do not respond to therapy and succumb to disease within months. The median survival is 8 to 13 months. And they share many features with their collecting the carcinoma. Next is your uh, sub sarcomatoid and rhabdoid differentiation. Um, sarcomatoid differentiation is found in 1 to 5% of RCCs, most commonly with clear cell RCC or chromophobe RCC, um, believed to be poorly differentiated regions of RCC rather than independently derived tumors. They are characterized by spindle cell histology, positive staining for vimentin, infiltrative growth pattern, aggressive local and metastatic behavior, and poor prognosis. Um, median survival is less than one year. For your rhabdoid differentiation, they can be seen with many subtypes of RCC. They, their presence mandates assignment of grade 4 and is associated with poor prognosis. Now, there are also your unclassified renal cell carcinomas, which presents a minority of cases of presumed RCC with features that remain indeterminate even after careful analysis. Many are poorly differentiated and are associated with a highly aggressive behavior and poor diagnosis. Now, for the clinical presentation of RCC, 60% uh, are uh, incidentally detected. Symptoms, however, can be due to local tumor growth, hemorrhage, paraneoplastic syndromes, or metastatic disease. The triad of flank pain, gross hematuria, palpable abdominal mass is now rare, and it denotes advanced disease. That is why it's now more aptly called the too-late triad. A less common important presentation is that of spontaneous perirenal hemorrhage in which the underlying mass may be obscured. 50% of patients with perirenal hemorrhage have an occult renal tumor, which are more often your AMLs or your RCCs. So here is a chart um, discussing the different clinical presentations in relation to, for example, the, uh, the symptoms of the advancing disease, the obstruction of the inferior vena cava, and the symptoms of systemic disease. Um, for the clinical presentation, there is what we call the paraneoplastic syndrome, which is found in 10 to 20% of patients with RCC. It is more common with metastatic disease and almost non-existent in patients with small incidental renal masses. The most common presentation of paraneoplastic syndrome is your elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which occurs in 50% of cases. Also, we can also find elevation in PTH like peptides, lupus type anticoagulant, HCG, insulin, various cytokines, and inflammatory mediators. Hypercalcemia in 13% due to paraneoplastic phenomena or osteolytic metastatic bone involvement, which has symptoms such as your nausea, anorexia, fatigue, and decreased uh, DTRs. Uh, hypertension and polycythemia are also commonly found. Hypertension secondary to increased renin production directly by the tumor or compression or encasement of the renal artery and its branches leading to renal artery stenosis or an AV fistula within the tumor. Polycythemia is due to increased erythropoietin production directly by the tumor or by the adjacent parenchyma in response to hypoxia induced by tumor growth. Stoffer syndrome, which occurs in 30 to 20, 20 percent of cases, is a non-metastatic hepatic dysfunction. It presents with elevated alkaline phosphatase level in 95 percent, elevated PT or hypoalbuminemia, elevated serum bilirubin or transaminases. Also, we will find thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, fever, and weight loss. The hepatic function normalizes after nephrectomy in 60 to 70 percent of in cases. Persistence or recurrence of uh, these symptoms is indicative of a viable tumor. Uh, less common symptoms of your paraneoplastic syndrome include your crushing syndrome, hyperglycemia, galactorrhea, neuromyopathy, clotting disorders, and cerebellar ataxia. The treatment of paraneoplastic syndrome is associated with RCC and requires surgical excision or systemic antineoplastic therapy to reduce the burden of disease. So now we move on to staging. Uh, the clinical staging of renal malignant, dis malignant disease begins with a thorough history, physical examination, and judicious use of laboratory tests. Symptoming, symptomic, systemic symptoms such as unintended weight loss of more than 10% of the body weight, cachexia, and poor performance status suggest an advanced disease. A non-reducing varicocele and lower extremity edema suggest venous, suggests venous involvement. 
radiographic staging, high quality abdominal CT scan, and the routine chest radiograph are sufficient. The MRI can also be used for locally advanced disease, equivocal venous involvement, and allergy to contrast. So this is your NCCN uh, guidelines version 2, 2020, for kidney cancer. So for TX, primary tumor cannot be assessed. T1, tumor is less than or equal to 7 cm in greatest dimension but is limited to the kidney. T2, the tumor is greater than 7 cm in greatest dimension but is limited to the kidney. T3, the tumor extends into major veins or perinephric tissues but not into the ipsilateral adrenal gland and not beyond the gerotus fascia. And T4, the, gero the tumor inv invades beyond the gerotus fascia including contiguous extension into the ipsilateral adrenal gland. So, in terms of imaging for staging, CT findings suggestive of extension into the perinephric fat include perinephric standing, distinct enhancing soft tissue density within the space. Patients with an enlarged or indistinct adrenal gland on CT, ex extensive malignant replacement of the kidney, or palpably abnormal adrenal gland are at risk for adrenal involvement. Enlarged hilar or retroperitoneal lymph nodes or those greater than 2 cm in diameter on CT almost always harbor malignant change but should be confirmed by surgery or biopsy. Mm, for CT findings suggestive of venous involvement, they include venous enlargement, abrupt change in caliber of the vein, filling defects, and collateral vessels. Uh, MRI is the premier study for the evaluation and staging of IVC tumor thrombus. For metastatic evaluation, a routine chest radiograph, systematic review of the abdominal and pelvic CT, and liver function tests are sufficient. The bone scan is for those with elevated alkaline phosphatase, bone pain, or poor performance, poor, poor performance status. Chest CT is for patients with pulmonary symptoms or an abnormal chest X-ray. Um, prognosis. Um, important prognostic factors for cancer-specific survival in non-metastatic RCC include specific clinical signs or symptoms, tumor-related factors, and various laboratory findings. Overall, tumor-related factors such as your pathologic state, tumor size, and nuclear grade, and histologic subtype have the greatest predictive ability for prognosis. So here are your adverse prognostic factors for renal cell carcinoma. So I'll just allow you to read it. Okay. Clinical findings that suggest a compromised prognosis in patients with presumed localized RCC include the symptomatic presentation, unintended weight loss, and poor performance status. Pathologic, pathologic stage has proven to be the single most important prognostic factor for RCC. Histologic type also carries prognostic significance, the presence of sarcomatoid or rhabdoid differentiation, or collecting duct renal medullary or unclassified histologic type denotes a poor prognosis. Here is the um, TNM stage in five-year cancer-specific survival for renal cell carcinoma. So it ranges from a seven to 70 to 90% five-year survival for organ-confined. Uh, renal tumors, and a 0 to 10% for patients with systemic metastasis. The treatment of localized renal cell carcinoma, uh, the 2017 AUA guidelines for renal mass and localized renal cancer provide an evidence-based review of this topic along with comprehensive recommendations for evaluation, counseling, and management. So why did I say this? This is the algorithm. So... It's too much to read now. Uh, I just put this for reference later on, but uh, I'll be discussing parts of it as we go along. So for risk stratification, 20% of solid enhancing clinical T1 masses are benign. They're often oncocytomas or typical AMLs. 30% of tumors less than 2CM are benign, and 9.5% 9, 9 of T1B tumors are benign. The size also correlates with high tumor grade, locally invasive phenotype, or unfavorable histology. Now, 
renal mass biopsy um, is safe with relatively low rates of hematoma, clinically significant pain, gross hematuria, pneumothorax, and hemorrhage requiring transfusion. transfusion. There have been no reported cases of RCC tumor seeding in modern literature, and the positive uh, biopsy is reliable with high specificity and positive predictive value. The non-diagnostic non rate for renal mass biopsy is approximately 14%, which can be substantially reduced with repeat biopsy. Histologic evaluation of RCC subtype is dependable, but accuracy for grade is variable. A non-malignant biopsy may not truly indicate that a benign entity is present. So renal mass biopsy is not indicated for young healthy patients who are unwilling to accept the limitations, the limitations of biopsy or older frail patients who will be managed conservatively even if the biopsy results in a potentially aggressive tumor. So here, um, after doing your renal mass biopsy with molecular profiling, 20% um, present as benign and they can opt to have active surveillance. 60% will present with indolent RCC and they have active surveillance, thermal ablation, and surgical excision as options. For the 20% uh, potentially aggressive RCC, uh, their option is surgical ex Their only option remains uh, surgical excision. So about um, surgical excision, Actually, Dr. Romero will be discuss, discussing um, nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy on Friday. So I'll only be uh, glancing at some topics. So now, um, yeah, actually, I can skip this. Uh, and this, yeah, okay. Now for the surveillance. For surveillance for clinically localized renal neoplasms, um, for follow-up measurements, PE and history, directed at detecting signs and symptoms of metastatic spread or local progression. Uh, basic laboratory testing, um, including CHEMS, progressive renal insufficiency or proteinuria should prompt nephrology referral, and uh, CBC, LDH, alkaline phosphatase at the discretion of the physician. For CNS imaging, acute neurologic signs should prompt uh, neurologic cross-sectional imaging of the head or spine. And for bone scan, again, elevated alkaline phosphatase and clinically, clinical symptoms such as bone pain uh, should prompt a bone scan. Next is the um, follow-up recommendations after radical or partial nephrectomy. So for partial nephrectomy, actually, it, we can just, uh, you can just read it. No? And so obtain a baseline abdominal scan 3 to 12 months after surgery. Um, obtain a yearly chest x-ray for three years or only as clinically indicated beyond that time period. Yeah. For partial nephrectomy, actually, Dr. Romero will also be discussing that. Okay. okay. Uh, how's this? Yeah. So patients who undergo nephron sparing surgery for RCC may be left with a remnant kidney and are at risk for development of long-term functional impairment from hyperfiltration. So after, this, after nephrectomy, there is also uh, total, total, total enucleation, which entails blood dissection along the pseudocapsule, thereby reducing the amount of normal parenchyma removed with the tumor. It reduces blood loss, it precludes entry into the collecting system, it facilitates zero ischemia and obviates the need for capsular. So here is the diagram detailing the difference between tumor inoculation and standard partial nephrectomy. So standard PN is typically performed by strategic sharp dissection through the parenchyma, leaving a small rim of normal parenchyma surrounding the mass. Tumor inoculation, however, consists of blunt dissection along the pseudocapsule, yielding a specimen that includes the tumor surrounded by the pseudocapsule with minimal or no parenchyma. So the main concern with total enucleation is oncologic, as is the basic, of te basic tenets of surgical oncology would prioritize an approach that avoids the pseudocapsule and reduces the risk of positive, positive surgical margins. Most reports of total enucleation have described relatively low rates of positive margins. And a uh, review of literature suggests that it is reasonable for many patients, but selection criteria is not well defined.
Another treatment modality are your thermal ablative therapies. Along with renal cryosurgery and radiofrequency ablation, uh, they are now established as your alternate nephron sparing treatments for patients with localized RCC. They can be administered percutaneously and thus offer reduced morbidity. In general, long-term efficacy of thermal ablative therapies is still not well established as surgical excision. And local recurrent rate, recurrence rates with primary TA are somewhat higher than those supported for traditional surgical approaches. So candidates for TA are patients with a reasonable life expectancy despite advanced age or significant comorbidities who prefer a proactive approach but are not optimal, optimal for conventional surgery. AUA guidelines advocate TA as an alternative approach for management of clinical T1A renal masses less than 3 centimeters in diameter. So another therapeutic option is active surveillance. This is for patients with small solid renal lesions who are elderly or have increased surgical risk and can safely be managed with observation and serial renal imaging at six months or one year intervals. Uh, these are for small, solid, or Bosniak T4 complex cystic masses or for tumors with reduced malignant potentials. potential or less than 2 centimeters in diameter. So for the imaging recommendations in active surveillance, um, percutaneous biopsy may be considered before active surveillance. CT or MRI within 3 to 6 months of active surveillance to establish a growth rate with continued imaging at least annually thereafter. Patients with biopsy-proven RCC or a tumor with oncocytic features should undergo annual chest X-ray. Now, for the treatment of locally advanced RCC, uh, the involvement of the venous system with RCC occurs in 4-10% to of cases. Uh, for the staging of the level of the IVC thrombus, stage 1 is adjacent to the ostium of the renal vein. Stage 2, it extends up to the lower aspect of the liver and below the hepatic veins. Stage 3 involves the intrahepatic portion of the IVC, IVC but below the diaphragm. And stage four, it extends above the diaphragm. So for the key points, um, 40 to 70% of patients with venous uh, tumor thrombus can be cured with nephrectomy and thrombectomy, including patients with tumor thrombus extending to the cardiac atrium. Um, they can be managed with isolation of the involved vasculature and removal of the tumor thrombus. Uh, tuber thrombus extending above the hep main hepatic veins requires more extensive dissection, veno venous bypass, or cardiopulmonary bypass and circulatory arrest. For large tumors with radiographic suspicion of invasion into adjacent structures, or T4, complete excision with end block resection of the involved structures provide the only chance of cure. Um, now, for, again, for your local invasive renal CA, uh, even with the aggressive surgical approach, the prognosis remains poor. 90% of patients ultimately died of the disease within 12 months. Incomplete excision of a largely uh, primary large tumor or debulking is rarely indicated because of the prognosis. For your lo local recurrence after radical nephrectomy or nephron sparing surgery, um, which includes recurrence in the renal fossa, ipsilateral renal gland, renal vein stump, or adjacent IVC, or ipsilateral retroperitoneal lymph nodes is uncommon and occurs only in 2 to 4% cases. The risk factors for these are your locally advanced or node positive disease and adverse features. Surgical resection of isolated recurrence of RCC after radical nephrectomy should be considered as it can provide cancer free status for patients in 30 to 40 percent of cases. However, complete resection of abdominal recurrence after surgery is a form formidable task because the natural tissue barriers are no longer present. Um, local recurrence in the remnant kidney after partial nephrectomy for RCC has been in the 1.4 to 10 percent uh, risk uh, range and the main risk factors are your advanced T-stage or high tumor grade. Patients with an isolated local recurrence after partial nephrectomy can be considered for repeat partial nephrectomy, completion nephrectomy, thermal ablative therapies, or active surveillance. For new adjuvant and adjuvant renal ther adjuvant therapy for RCC, 
distant metastasis develop in 20 to 35 percent of cases and local recurrence in 25 percent of cases. Given the result of numerous studies done on different agents, none of the adjuvant studies are convincingly positive. And the standard of care remains observation if the patient will not consider an adjuvant, will not consider an adjuvant client. So after discussing our CC, we now move on to the other malignant tumors. So we have the sarcomas of the kidney, which represent 1-2% of all malignant tumors in adults with peak incidence in the fifth decade of life. Specific findings include the apparent origin from the capsule or the perisinus, growth to large size in the, absence, in the absence of lymphadenopathy, rapid growth, presence of fat or bone. Leiomyosarcoma is the most common, which is in 50 to 60% of cases, and high-grade sarcomas metastasize with lungs as the primary site. The most important prognostic factors in these cases are your margin status and tumor grade. The other types of sarcomas of the kidney are your liposarcoma, which is characterized by the presence of fat, osteogenic sarcoma, which contains calcium and is, calcium and is often rock-hard, and can mimic a staghorn calculus on plain films. Less common are your rhabdomyosarcomas, fibrosarcomas, malignant fibrous histiosoma, histiocytoma. The management for these sarcomas is wide localization with negative margins. Next, um, are your li renal lymphomas and leukemias. The renal involvement with hematologic malignancies is common. 34% of patients dying of progressive lymphoma or leukemia are found to have renal involvement. So it is more common with your non-Hodgkin lymphoma than with your Hodgkin disease. Primary renal lymphoma is rare. Hematogenous dissemination of lymphoma to the kidney occurs in 90%, while the rest is explained by direct extension from retroperitoneal lymph nodes. CT scan is the radiographic modality of choice for monitoring response to therapy. Renal lymphoma should be suspected in patients with massive retro retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, or lymphadenopathy in other regions of the body or typical regions within the retroperitoneum. If lymphoma or leukemic renal involvement is suspected, the consideration should be given to percutaneous biopsy or aspiration for diagnosis. Important to consider is Surgery should be avoided if renal lymphoma and leukemia are suspected because the primary treatment of these processes is system systemic chemotherapy with or without radiation therapy. Uh, metastatic tumors are the most common malignant neoplasms in the kidney. So most common, in fact, are your metastatic tumors. Almost renal, all renal metastases develop through hematogenous route of spread because of the profuse vascularity of the kidney. The most common sources of renal metastasis are your lung first, and then your breast, your gastrointestinal cancers, malignant melanomas, and hematologic malignant neoplasms. Most metastases are multifocal. Almost all are associated with widespread non-renal metastasis. They should be suspected in any patient with multiple renal lesions and widespread systemic metastasis or a history of non-renal primary cancer. Next are your carcinoids, which are uncommon lignal malignant neoplasms with, few, with fewer than 60 cases in literature. They are associated with horseshoe kidneys, and, and diagnostic is your measurement of urinary plasma, urinary or plasma serotonin. Um, for those who may present with it, uh, the symptoms are episodic, flushing, wheezing, and diarrhea. CT scan findings are unspecific. Many are small, non-aggressive, yet uh, metastasis were found. Surgical excision is the mainstay treatment with nephron sparing surgery. And prognosis is actually good. Next are your neuroendocrine tumors, such as your, your small cell carcinoma, and primary large neuroendocrine carcinoma, which can occur in the kidney, but even less common than renal carcinoids. It has features of neuroendocrine and epithelial neoplasms and must be differentiated from your Wilms tumor. Next are your primitive neuroectodermal tumors, which are related to the Ewing sarcoma family of tumors and are more common in the pediatric population. Multimodal treatment protocols combining tumor debulking, chemotherapy, radiotherapy are employed. It has a poor prognosis with a five-year disease-free survival rate of 45 to 35%. And lastly, uh, Wilms tumor, which is the most common abdominal malignant neoplasm in children, but only in 3% of cases in adults. 
it is a heterogeneous intrarenal mass and CT with relatively hypovascular pattern. Treatment is multimodal and the prognosis is worse for adults than for, for children. And that is my last slide. Thank you. Ayos. Oh, isang oras pa pala eh. Kaya. <laughs> And then, yung ano kanina yung boss na, boss niya. Ano yes, yung classification yun? Through CT images ba yun or through ultrasound? CT, sir. CT. Enhancement. So, pag may nakita kayo yung nag-boss niya classification na nilagay sa ultrasound, maniniwala <laughs> ba kayo? <laughs> oh, sir. Maniniwala ka? Ah, hindi, hindi, sir. Oh, Siyempre. Ah, okay. <laughs> Eh, wala. Ibang klase ultra sound niya kung may enhancement. Uh, hindi kasi, di ba may mga ultrasound na nagaganon, nag, na biglang nagsasabi na Bosniak 1. Uh, yes, sir. May nakita na ako report na ganun. Uh, okay. <laughs> Nagaling. So, yeah. Okay. So, okay more, no more questions for the... So, part 2 will be on... Friday. So, it's a bit more technical than this. Uh, so, be on Friday. Can we open the webcams for... Uh, uh, yeah. Wait. Sure. 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 We okay. Okay, yeah, okay. okay, thank you, sirs. All right. Thank you, thank you. Night for sirs. Night. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you.